Hall of Fame weekend 2007. There's the Uncle Dave. Welcome to Cobra's Town. Oh yeah. How many times you struck him out? No, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I remember what I did. Yeah. Are you like Jim Palmer that can remember like the third pitch to so and so in the 1969? Well, I can remember. Who's on the mark right now? Uh, Johnny Padres, yeah. Al Kaline, Jim Bunning, Jim Rice. Tom Fellows coming any minute. Thanks. Linfield will be here. Ralph Warren, Taylor Perry. This is as crowded as I've ever seen it here. Okay, here's the deal. Okay. Right. Look, 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 look. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. I am, you know where the corner of Pomerado and Rancho Bernardo Road is? Yeah. I live three blocks away from Pomerado, up Rancho Bernardo, right when it turns into a spola. Who's closer? Who's close? Give me the bottle. Get this. Ah! Who's closer? <laughs> Hold it right there. Hold it right there. Hold it right there. Okay. And that well, was one good fucking meal. You did such a good job, his son became a priest. Is that right? <laughs> God bless him. Is that right? Yeah, that's pretty funny. Except I was going to ask Ray ourselves. And I saw my Timothy Frog. Timothy Frog here showing me Tony Gwynn's stuff. Try it on. Yeah. Doesn't fit. Give it back. You know the fellow's name? Yes. Well, then who's playing first? Yeah. I mean, the fellow's name on first base. Who? The fellow playing first base for St. Louis. Who? The guy on first base. Who is on first? What are you asking me for? I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's who's name. There's Raleigh, there's Goose, there's Harmon Killebrew, there's Juan Marichal. Greg Nettles. Greg Nettles eating a chip. Jose, what the hell is this? It was a Ted Williams Parkway thing we did in Palo. See you guys. Dave Winfield, Jerry Coleman, and Mr. Whitey Ford. Having fun? Yeah, I'm having fun. This is Cooperstown. <laughs> Stop tickling me, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Mr. Media Pass forgets to take off the lens cap. Well, that was a cool day before inductions. Back here at the Young Compound. Cheese is right. There's plenty of cheese there. <laughs> okay, Michelle, you serve. Oh, wait a second. We have something for Dad because... Um, uh oh, something for Dad. Oh, right. Right. Oh, no. Something from Bellagio, I hope. That's for you. Never. From, yes, from us. Is. It's a car. Oh. It's a car. You pour water on it. <laughs> you know, I was just going to say, what, no prifties? But now I can't say that. Uh -huh. so and look at, look at what it is. It's a sorted mix. Okay. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, we'll now comes a tough choice. Oh, no, the lasagna. Right. You better do the lasagna. Supper, I, don't know, I don't know. But supper, you know, supper, I supper. Supper. That's true. Actually, it starts in a box. Induction Day 2007, here comes the pilgrimage of people. To the Clark Sports Center, as far as the eye could Tony see. Tony Gwynn rolls! Tony Gwynn rolls! <laughs> He rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded! Somewhere men are laughing and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Thank you, folks. Steve Garvey, how are you? Tony. 
the TV voice of the Baltimore Orioles, a, fi a fixture on ESPN, and today's Master of Ceremonies, Gary Thorne. Thank you, everybody, and thanks, Dale. Catch your 10 straight gold gloves, popularizing the one-handed style of catching, and at the plate, 389 lifetime home runs and MVP in 1970, and in 72, the World Series MVP in 76. One of the greatest catchers ever to play this game, Johnny Bench. from the Los Angeles Dodgers, three World Series championships, Sandy Koufax. His managerial style had a lot of names to it, feisty, confrontational, opinionated, and successful. He became known as the Oriole Way. Focused on player development, he became the Earl of Baltimore, Earl Weaver. Award winner, 324 home runs over 19 years, a two-time All-Star Most Valuable Player Award. He had the big hit in the 10th inning of Game 6 of that magnificent 86 World Series. Please welcome the kid, Gary Carter. Twelve gold gloves, a record tying 24 All-Star games, and made one of the greatest catches in baseball history on Vic Words in the 54 World Series. Say Ted Williams, I was content hitting the ball up the middle of the other way. And then after, I wasn't afraid to let my swing go and pull the ball, hit the ball out in front. And what I realized was I could do it all. I could do all of it. Instead of just doing one half of it, I could do all of it, which therefore made me a better hit. Quinn's career 338 average is the 17th highest of all time, but of that elite group, only he and Ted Williams played after 1938. Gwynn won eight batting titles, only Ty Cobb won more. Gwynn batted 300 from 19 straight seasons, only Cobb had a longer streak. From 1993 to 1997, Gwynn hit 368. Williams never hit that high for any five-year period, and during that five-year period, Gwynn hit an astonishing 337 when he had two strikes. In that time, his average with two strikes was better than anyone in the game using all their strikes. 
Wins hits went everywhere, but he especially liked slashing singles between the third baseman and shortstop. That's why he had 5.5 written on the tongue of his spikes, because it reminded him every at bat of the 5.5 hole, the hole between the third baseman and shortstop. In 20 years, he struck out 434 times. Adam Dunn has that many in just under two and a half seasons. Wynn never struck out more than 40 times in a season. Preston Wilson once struck out that many times in April. Wynn had 252 three-hit games and one three-strikeout game. But he was so much more than a hitter. He won five gold gloves in right field. He stole 319 bases, including 56 in 1987. Wynn is the only player in the last 80 years to hit 338 with 300 stolen bases. In 1994, the year he hit 394 and was denied a shot at 400 because of the strike, Wynn used one bat for almost the whole season. He called it seven grains of pain. And did he ever cause pain for pitchers for 20 years? <laughs> out here because I need my nose here because I'm going to struggle. Hold up. <laughs> You've been telling me all day is my day, so. June 8, 1981, I got drafted in the morning by the San Diego Padres. Jack McKeon, who I saw here yesterday, I, I really tried to tried to emulate some of the things that Garb told me. He said, stay on an even keel. He said, he said, never get too high, too low. Just go about your business. Go about your business the right way. And that's what I tried to do. Now, I got to tell you, he, he, he was a great man, but he was honoring when it came to hitting a baseball. And I used to ask him, I'd say, Ted, you got, you know, you got four guys on the right side of the field. Why don't you hit the ball the other way? I wasn't going to let those guys beat me. I wasn't going to let them beat me. And that stubbornness, that that feistiness, I think, kind of rubbed off on me. And from that point in 1992 to the end of my career, as far as I'm concerned, I was a, a much better hitter. I, I've, I've never been a home run guy, never been a big RBI guy. But from that point to the end of my career, I was much better at it. When you sign your name, I'm a big believer in when you sign your name on a dotted line, it's, it's more than just playing a game of baseball. I think if you look out here today, you see all these people out here today, um, they love the game too. And there's a responsibility when you put that uniform on that those people, those people who pay to go watch you play, you're responsible. You gotta, you gotta make good decisions and show people how things are supposed to be done. And all the fans that have made this trek all the way to Cooperstown, I can't begin to thank you. I know some of y'all were in a bus. Some of y'all drove in your cars. I see the brown and gold. I see the orange and blue. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm going to be a grandpa in October for the first time, so that child's got no chance. <laughs> and my daughter Anisha, who sang the Canadian anthem and the national anthem. You guys, I'm so proud of you guys. I really am. You guys, your mom did a wonderful job. watching the way you handle. Being a son of a major league player is sometimes a difficult thing, but you guys have always handled it great. is marked by a number, a start and an end. But I can assure you it was not accomplished with a view to a given number or end point. And I certainly wasn't aware when I started in this game where it would lead me. Good job, babe. Fantasy kid, man.
Reggie forgot something. Another one in the books. We're live at ORC. Adam Webster and Uncle Dave about to cause chaos. Fam Oldies 98.9, 7.33, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. I'm Adam Webster. These are the great hits of the 60s and 70s. So uh, what a weekend. Went to the Baseball Hall of Fame inductions in uh, Cooperstown, New York. Took my Uncle Dave, big San Diego Padres fan. Got to see his man, Tony Gwynn. You had a good time? Oh, Tony. So we saw so many Hall of Famers uh, in Cooperstown this weekend for the Baseball Hall of Fame inductions. Just rubbing elbows with people like uh, Yogi uh, Berra with Whitey Ford. One Marshall. And Duke Snyder, Willie Mays, they were all there. So uh, we took in a minor league baseball game at Double Day Field, because we've been walking up and down quite a bit. We've been moving around. We said, you know, why don't we just sit down and uh, reflect and uh, take a look at some of our photographs. Yeah, see what we captured in photographs for the day. So we go in, maybe about the fifth inning, it started to rain, so we figured let's get out of the rain. So there we are in the stadium, and uh, it looked like... The second day after we sat down, it looked like they were attending to the pitcher. Maybe the pitcher had gotten hurt. We had heard the crack of a bat, and it was loud. The guy goes down. Before he goes down, though, what did he do? He made the play. He that picked up the ball. He threw it to first base. But then he's down, and apparently he must have been in some deep pain. Well, we thought maybe he hurt his wrist, so the, you know, the trainer comes out, the catcher comes out, the manager comes out there looking at him, and we said, all right, while they're doing that, let's look at some pictures. Uh, so there's pictures of us with Danny McLean and then all these different guys, and there's a good picture of you and Pete Rose. Thank you very much. A very masculine picture. And me. then you took the picture of me and Pete Rose, and when I saw the picture uncontrollably started to just laugh. The switch went on. You know those giggles you have and you can't <laughs> stop them? And now because he's giggling, I'm giggling. And I am cackling like a like a, like a schoolgirl. I, I don't know how you were my, nef uh, my niece, not my nephew. So the picture was, um, I was shaking his hand, but I guess something happened where my hand sort of bent and... You weren't shaking, you were presenting it like you were the Queen of England for a little <laughs> smooch on the hand. Like I was presenting my hand for someone to kiss it. It was so bad. When do you have a another chance to have Pete Rose shake your hand? He's looking at the camera, I'm looking at the camera, we're both smiling, and here we are tackling. The problem was, the guy on the mound, here I am, <laughs> the guy on the mound got hit in the man parts. I noticed that no one else in the entire stadium was moving, breathing, let alone making a sound, and we're doing what? All you can hear is, <laughs> and then the guy going, Ooh. I and have to think they... everybody was looking at us. We, I was so red in the face, and when we left, it was so embarrassing. What, I mean, we're sitting next to the manager's wife, oh my God, who yes. told us. She told us he was down there, and she found that he had none of that, what do you call it, protection? Wasn't wearing a cup. Yeah, that. Essentially. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, I don't know how that picture, if you could do something to please crop that picture so I'm not technically, uh, I'm going to try to do yeah, a, a delete from my memory because that was embarrassing. You're going to send that to the entire family, right, I know. Yeah, it was a little embarrassing. All right, 736 on ORCFM, all these 98.9, back to the hits next. This has been The Intern, signing off. So they're taking down the uh, stage from the police concert. Sting and the police performed this weekend. They're still ripping that down. And we're back here in the uh, Budweiser Pavilion down the right field line. They have some seats here you can sit and watch the game from the fair post. The game's here at Fenway Park. Prior to that, we had to go to Braves Field and play. Down about a mile down the road on Commonwealth Avenue. Is that right? Big group is sold to the New York Yankees for $125,000. That's referred to as the curse of the Bambino here at Fenway Park. We don't win a World Series, another World Series after 1918 for 86 years. <laughs> what happens to Fenway Park, the ballpark? Well, the ballpark, all right, goes into disarray. It is absolutely in the 1920s. We don't even play 500 baseball here. We got fires breaking out all over the ballpark. 
the, uh, man, the owner, Mr. Quinn, is just about ready to sell the ballpark, play at Braves Field. He doesn't have, he doesn't even want anything to do with this place. You would be disgusted if you came here in 1928, 1929. He's lucky, he takes his $15 million, buys the Boston Red Sox and Fenway Park, and guess what he does? He guts it out. He guts everything out of this ballpark, and the only thing that's left is a superstructure. That's all. And that brick that I told you that was outside on our way over here. And what does he do? All right, he renovates Fenway Park in 1934. And what you see in front of you right now and behind me is Tom Yawkey's Fenway Park. Oh, you're taking a video. Oh, yeah. Now batting number 37 from San Diego, California. Mr. David Corbin. Well, it's just a matter of getting the turret flat down quicker, that's all right. I'm going to do Hello, you guys still there? These are the uh, standing room only seats that we had for the uh, Mets Red Sox game last year with Shell. And then when Dad and I came here, we sat like right there. We were sitting right there to uh, watch the game a couple of years ago. It looks like Schilling is completing his rehab stint. Today's actually a day off. And uh, Schilling is playing a little catch out there. So these are the grandstands, the really, really old original seats. Yeah, it's uh, troops. Yeah, families are the troops. Yeah, you don't have to use your mommy's car. All right, thanks.